Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Indeed, we depend on God. Without God, there is nothing that we can do. We want to give you a special welcome to the hour of glory where we share God's infallible word and prepare men for eternity. My name is Albert Collingwood, and I remain your brother in the faith. Tonight, wherever you are, we bring you a message of hope. And I want to quickly read uh, something from uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, verse number 3. It says, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. Tonight, we've come to remind you of the faithfulness of God. The Bible says the faithfulness of God reaches onto multiple generations. It's not in our time that God is going to become unfaithful. So tonight, be encouraged knowing that every purpose that God has ordained for your life will find fruition. Tell a friend to tell a friend that we are live on the hour of glory and God has an appointment with us tonight. Tonight, we have a very powerful and interesting program and God has blessed us with two great men of God that are going to help us in this discussion. And I believe that your life will never, ever be the same. So for a minute, I want to play a theme song once again for a minute whilst people are uh, trooping in. And then we'll be right back. I will introduce our panelists and then we'll take it from here. God bless you. Please share the video. Tell a friend to tell a friend that we are live on the hour of glory. And tonight, once again, God is going to touch us and bless us at the point of our need. Please don't touch that dial. Stay with us and we will be right back. May God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God's glory is all that we need. Thank you for staying with us. And once again, welcome back to the Hour of Glory, uh, where we share God's infallible word and prepare men for eternity. Relationship is the fuel that powers the vehicle of life. Our relationships 
is the fuel that powers the vehicle of our lives. And without the right relationships, you can never ever get to your destination in life. Without the right relationships in your life, you can never ever get to the destination that God has ordained for your life. And that is why, in fact, when you read the 10 commandments, it is said that four out of the 10 commandments talk about our relationship with God. And then six out of the 10 talk about our relationship with men. And interestingly, on the cross, while Jesus was on the cross, he confirmed that when Jesus was on the cross, he was reconciling men back to God, reconciling our relationship with God back to where it was supposed to be. And then in the physical, the Bible tells us that he was also reconciling men. When you read John chapter 19, from verse 25 to 29, you realize that Jesus said that, John, behold your mother. And then he told his mother also uh, to behold John. So basically, he was mending the relationship between the two people. So our walk with God is all about relationships. It's all about relationships. But the fact of the matter is that in every relationship, sometimes there can be conflicts. That is one fact that we cannot deny. In every relationship, sometimes there can be conflict. So it is said that two uh, most important skills everybody needs in life is conflict resolution and then how to de-escalate conflict. And tonight we're going to talk about conflicts. We're going to talk about conflicts. And in fact, we're going to zero in on the Arab-Israeli conflict. That is what we're going to talk about. And God has blessed us with two wonderful resources, two great men of God, and that God has blessed with a great level of knowledge when it comes to a conflict and specifically the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I want to go ahead and introduce them. I have the singular honor and privilege uh, to introduce both of them before uh, they take the podium and bless us. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and introduce our first panelist before we take the second introduction. Our first panelist is Reverend Joe Quapon. <laughs> he is the founder and the head pastor of New Bridge Church in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. He's a psalmist and an author. Uh, some of the books that he's written include The Father Factor and The Ultimate Sacrifice. He was called into ministry in 1984. He's married to Lady Vicky Quapon, and God has blessed them with two beautiful girls, Cheryl and Adriel. In August of 2010, Bishop Joe and his wife, Lady Vicky, launched Life Givers Missions, a charitable organization which began its widow's might operation to the underprivileged and homeless in abandoned buildings and the bridges and street corners of downtown Atlanta. In the last two years, Life Givers, with the support of its partners, has expanded its operations to many suburbs in Ghana, West Africa, where hundreds of children have been fed clothed to the glory of God. So people of God, uh, help me welcome and introduce Bishop Joe Quapon. Bishop, we don't see you. If you can uh, please turn on your camera. There he is. That's the handsome brother of mine. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Bishop. I'll go ahead and also introduce our second panelist. David Barnes uh, has been a believer since 1967. He's a historian specializing in the history of, Christian, of the Christian church. He's married to Marianne and they are both believers in God's promises for Israel and the Jewish people. They have both visited Israel several times and are heavily involved in intercessory prayer. They both believe in praying for the salvation of the Jewish people and for the peace of Jerusalem. They both believe that biblical prophecy is being enacted in this generation. So people of God, help me welcome Pastor David Baines. Pastor Baines, please say hi to the people of God. <laughs> hello. hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and may, God, may God bless you and keep you. Amen. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Amen. <laughs> amen. 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 So as we all know, the Arab-Israeli conflict began in 1949, where the five Arab nations rose up against Israel following the announcement of the independence of Israel. And after that, we all know about the conflicts that have you know, continued until, until today. And to help us answer some of the questions surrounding this conflict, its place in biblical prophecy, and what we are expecting to happen in the future, uh, Pastor David Baines will take over and then uh, give us 
a few insights into the subject after which myself and Pastor Joe will also chime in with questions here and there. Uh, so Pastor David, you can please take over and drive the wheel from here. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Right. A little bit of extra background in sense about the, myself. I've, I'm an historian I've, and, and I've specialized in, when I'm specializing in the history of the Christian church has led me into study of both the New Testament and the Hebrew scriptures. And it's increasingly led me to explore the Hebraic roots of the faith. Now, the Messiah, Yeshua, the son of David, was, is, and forever shall be a Jew. And that's what the people need to remember that. And remember his statement to the woman at Sychar, the Samaritan woman. Mm -hmm. we, you worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is of the Jews. And in the past 40 years, I've been studying these, the Hebraic roots of the faith. And inextricably bound up with that is the study of the history of the Jewish people and their relationship with God and their relationship with the land of Israel. And it's also led me to explore their place in biblical prophecy, especially eschatology and the end times. Now, God's relationship with the Jews in this whole issue of the land, especially with the land, is it's central. The story really is the creation of a people, their growth into a nation with a unique religion and a relationship with it, and a unique relationship with their God. This relationship has been at times a pretty stormy one. The Jews being exiled from their country, being brought back again, exiled yet again and restored to the land in the 20th century, in the, in the last century. Now, it's this land, the state of Israel and its capital, especially its capital, Jerusalem, which I believe in this, in this context, it's vital to explore that. We cannot forget that because it is, Jerusalem is crucial. It is the place to where the Messiah will return. Okay. It says so in Zechariah. I'll read it out. Zechariah 14, one through, one through, three through four. Sorry, three through four, I beg your pardon. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On this day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half the mountain moving north and half south. If you look at the Western news media, and you've seen commentators on both sides, and you know, they're saying you're getting commentators and politicians making one proposal after another, which usually mean concessions by both sides. All that happens is these efforts fail, and the politicians go away and come back with yet another proposal. What doesn't seem to occur to them, and I'm bound to say a great many Western Christians, at least in my experience anyway, is that the Arab-Israeli conflict is not amenable to a human political solution. Well, I believe, maintain that this war between Arabs and Jews, and I have to say, well, if you're looking at it purely in terms of Israel, Arabs and Jews, is both a spiritual war and a family feud. Mm -hmm. The conflict's not simply between Jew and Arab. It is between the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Satan, the accuser of the brethren, the enemy of souls. Now, can I just interject? Uh, and Pastor David, one thing that I didn't say and would like to go on record as saying is that Pastor David is my brother-in-law. Okay. Yes, yeah, married to my. So we have to declare an interest. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I missed so, I missed that one in the introduction. You did. <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, yes. So Pastor David is family, and and he speaks better Chi than a lot of Africans speak. <laughs> yes. So 
I just needed to throw that in. And he, uh, yeah, there's hardly any Ghanaian food, fufu, banku, you name it, that he doesn't know about. So uh, as David is, uh, is very well traveled and, uh, you know, thank God for him. Amen. Now, I just, I, I needed to uh, just say this briefly, and he is the, he's the, uh, uh, you know, the professor, the ex expert, as you can tell from that, mm -hmm. you know, rich history that he's giving us. Mm -hmm. um, I want to take us to Genesis 17, mm -hmm. where the scripture says, Abraham was about 90 years old or 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. At the time, his name was Abraham. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the scripture says, and this is directed to uh, Pastor David to kind of comment on it once I get through all this. He said, I am, God says to him, or Yahweh says, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be perfect. Mm -hmm. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thy seed. The scripture goes on to say how Ab Abram fell on his face and, you know, God said, as for me, my covenant is with thee. I will make you a father of many nations. Uh, then God changed his name. He said, well, your name shall no longer be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, mm -hmm. you know, which is a father of many nations. Mm -hmm. Have I made thee? And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, et cetera, et cetera. And I will make nations out of thee and kings shall come out of thee. God, Yahweh says to him. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your seed and to generations as an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you. Mm -hmm. However, in verse eight of Genesis 17, a very interesting statement, and I will give unto you and to your seed after thee, the land of where which thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So for a person with a regular mind, if in verse eight, if we can put up, okay, verse eight. Thank you. And I will give unto you and your descendants after the land in which uh, you are a stranger. And I want to emphasize that word stranger, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, we're talking conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. In the book of Amos 3 and 3, it says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Mm -hmm. So for somebody looking at this uh, text and says, well, Abraham was a stranger in a land. He went to a place where he was a stranger. Mm -hmm. All the land of Canaan, although we understand that God says, I would give it to you. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody comes and lays claim to the land. Palestinians say, you know what? It is our land. You are a stranger. God says it himself. You can see it in the, in the Holy Scriptures. Mm -hmm. So to a person like that, and remember, we're talking conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. The Hebrew Bible says in Matthew 18, Forgive me uh, for uh, the, the exact verse, but it says that if you have an ought, I want to say verse 18 or 19 or maybe 17, if you have an ought against your brother, mm -hmm. the scripture says, go fix it. Go to the person, talk about it and seek resolution. Mm -hmm. If they don't hear you, take another person with you and go try to get resolution. If it doesn't happen, take a couple more people till you get to the church level. Thank you. So you get to the church level, but then it says something interesting that after you bring the church, which I'm saying, I'm uh, equating that to be, you know, go through all the different levels to seek resolution. Let them be to you a tax collector. Let them be a pagan or just, in other words, cut ties with them if you still can't resolve it. So in with all these scriptures we've read, what do you say to a person who says, you came in there as a stranger. Your God gave you the land. We want to be settlers in there, or you took over our land. What is, what is the biblical response, or what is, the, what is the proper response to something like that? I hope my, my 
uh, yeah, I, 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 I can see I can see where you're coming from on this one. Okay. Abraham, Ab Abraham was a wanderer in that because that that land itself at that point in time didn't belong didn't actually belong to him. It was um, under the fairly loose control of the Egyptians. Okay. Yeah. Th in fact, it, um, there were still Hittites there as well. Uh, obviously, he bought the plot of land from Ekron, the Hittite. Uh, that was what was left of a few remnants of the old Hittite empire, which had disappeared basically um, um, just shortly before, just shortly after Abraham was born. But what he's saying there, it's he was a wanderer there. However, it was also, but it was also said, and it's a little bit further on if you take it. We're talking in Genesis 17. Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, what what happens is that that Abraham is what was prophesied was that that the children of Israel would be would be slaves because this covenant was actually renewed mm -hmm. to his son Isaac, his firstborn son, and it was also renewed to Jacob at Bethel. Mm -hmm. The promise was made to both the son and the grandson, but. God had an unfolding plan for this because the Canaanites, what the situation was in, in Canaan was, um, they could say that Abraham was a, a wanderer there, a sojourner, which he was. He was a nomad. But the future for, a, for, the, for salvation, God's plan of salvation for the whole world was through the descendants of Abraham. If you look in, in Matthew chapter one, but the genealogy of Yeshua, you will start it Abraham. But also it has something to do about, about again, about strangers as well, because there is in the Hebrew scriptures, especially in Exodus, it says treat strangers as well. For remember, you were strangers in Egypt. So people say you, you're coming in, you're a wonder, you're an immigrant. If you're equating that with the situation now, um, the situation that prevailed in the 1890s when the first Aliyah came there, and also a bit later uh, later on with, 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 with Jewish immigration after World War II, you're not actually comparing like with like. Because in the 1890s, there was that land that the Jews bought was completely depopulated. There was no population there at all, apart from some Bedouin who were nomads. There was no settled population. There were Arab populations in some of the towns, but that land which the Jews settled, they bought it. Like Abraham brought, bought that plot from Ekron the Hittite for his tomb in Hebron. But that is the... And that is what happened. And also that this Canaan isn't actually, wasn't actually the Jews' land. It's God's land, which he chose to put his name on. That is the point. But the reason God allowed the Jewish people to come back after the, the exodus from Egypt. He had to take them out of, out, of, out of Canaan so they could find a place so they could multiply and be strong enough to go back and take the land because the land, the evil that was going on within amongst the Canaanites, Canaanite religion was you know, sacrifice of human sacrifice and sacrifice of children in the fires of Moesh. You know, all sort of, well, anything and everything, you name it, it happened all in the name of their faith. And it had gone up as such a stench before God that in the end it said, enough. These people, I will, I will, I will end these people. That's what God, that's what, that was God's sovereign, sovereign, sovereign huh? people that was God's sovereign decision to end the Canaanites because of their evil practices 
especially child sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Now, I can see why people would say that, but the thing is also most of the Arabs who came to, to, to what was then Ottoman Palestine after the Jews arrived and started to prosper, and the land, dis the land prospers and grows when the Jewish people are there because it's God's land and he chose it for them. That is God's sovereign choice. Okay. <clears throat> so, so they would then, the people, the Arabs came in response to that. Well, there's jobs, there's prosperity. It looks, it's better than they haven't got work here. So there's obviously work to be had in, Israel, in, in, in Ottoman Palestine. So let's go there. Let's, let's. Let's let's find let's find work there. And with yeah, Mr. David, can, can I ask, um, can I ask a question yeah, here? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I know that there are people that are of the uh, school of thought, the perspective that during that war in 1948, after Israel declared its independence, independence in 1948, and the armies of Jordan, Syria, Egypt, and Iraq came together to fight against them, they were defeated. Right. So basically, because they were defeated and in those days and even now, when when there is war, whichever country wins the war, in a way, takes takes the land. Right. Yeah. So it in a way makes it legitimately theirs because they won the war. When do you, you ascribe to that that school of thought? Well, by right, it's international law recognized by right of conquest. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, However, what we're talking about is land that was granted by treaty to the Jewish people, mm -hmm. that, that home right up to the Jordan River. That's in international treaty at, the, at San Remo in 1922. So if you're talking about it legally, they're perfectly entitled to be there. And what also happened in, in 1948 with the war, the, the Jewish, the Arab populations, the, the, the Arab countries encouraged the Arab population there to leave. They said, right, come, come, come away, abandon your homes, come away, we'll look after you. We'll soon see off these Jews, which what they mean was wipe them out, which is effectively what they were trying to do. And then you can go back and, and take over their farms. And you know, once we've got rid of the Jews, I massacred the Jews or driven them out, whatever way, we don't care one way or the other. Then you can have the farms and everything else and everything they built. You can all take it all for yourselves. Hmm. But that didn't happen. They lost. And so those populations were left stranded in camps. Now, I'm looking, okay, I'm to be where my, in, in international law, there is no right of return for the refugee. It doesn't exist. It never has. Not in international law anyway. Refugee populations. Now, they can, what usually happens with them in, in refugee, refugee populations is if they're in a host country, they tend they settle. They're usually absorbed between, it takes about two, two or three generations for the completely absorbed into the host country if they wish to stay there. And the Arabs say they want to want to return, and you know a law, a, a law of return. There's an interesting book I've got on my bookshelves called "The War of Return," and this was written by two left-wing secular Jews. They're saying that the, the Arab insistence on this return is 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 the biggest obstacle to peace there is. So instead of actually resettling these refugees <laughs> on land that was available, because Remember, in 1948, huge chunks of Judea and Samaria, the you know, mountains of Israel, there's a little bit of enclave with West Jerusalem, came, came up to the old city. Huge chunk of the country was, in fact, taken and taken by the Jordanians. There's no, there was never actually a treaty, a peace treaty granting that. That, that line was just an armistice line. It was not, that was never a treaty. And when they, they decided to try wiping Israel out again in 1967, the Israeli army overran the whole Judea and Samaria, and they took Jerusalem from the Jordanians and took it, the border, right up to the River Jordan. Now, 
they didn't really need to annex it because legally it was theirs anyway. What they did do was take the Golan Heights off Syria. Now, the Syrians, Syria isn't getting that back. Hmm. There's no legal right. They've, you know, the Jews are there. They, it's by right of, and they have formally annexed it to Israel, which actually, illegally, um, they have got every right to do. There's nothing in this. Let, <laughs> let me interject here, if, if um, you don't mind. So let me let me ask you. Basically, uh, schooled us on how we ended up here. Basically, the history, right, and where we are at the moment. And my question is, what should be the church's position at this moment in this twenty first century? What role should the church play in this conflict? What do you think should be a well position? role play in the conflict? I think I think one should the church. One thing that should be praying for the conversion to Christ, to the to the belief in the messiah in of both jew and muslim because in israel themselves there are fellowships and messianic jewish fellowships mm. so there's one up up in near near haifa stella carmel on mount carmel mm. where we have jewish believers and arab believers who worship together but that is one new man in Messiah. That, frankly, is the only reconciliation and only solution for this conflict. Political solutions simply will not work because they're based, they're not based on anything. Because there are in like in Bethlehem Baptist Church, for example, the pastors there, he they a father and son, they pray and have fellowship with Jewish believers in Jesus. And also, there's a love, wonderful minister. There's two minutes. Two minutes. One, a guy called um, a Messianic Jewish rabbi called Zev Porat, who evangelizes, and also um, an online ministry, one for Israel, by uh, headed by Dr. Aitan Bar, who and Jewish people are the the, the most wired and online people you get. <laughs> Israelis, they're the most wired and online people you will ever find. Quite honestly, everything the, the they can't actually preach openly because then you know the, the police would shut you down. The rabbinate would would go would go would go ape, and so they work online. And Jewish people are finding and, and people are and Jewish people, both Jews and Arabs, are coming to faith in Messiah. It's an interesting point that in 1967, when mm -hmm. Jerusalem was reunited, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I know I was. I, I was saved in that year myself, and I remember it. And from that point of view, the number of, G of Israeli citizens who believed in Messiah Yeshua mm -hmm. has grown exponentially. There's over, there's over 35, okay, the population is about eight, eight to nine million. And there's at least 35,000, if not more. And they're from all the Jewish communities, either the Western Jews, um, Eastern Mizraki Jews, okay. Ethiopian <laughs> Jews, even the Jews, B'nai Menashe coming from India. Um, so they, they're being drawn, Jews are being drawn back and they're meeting their saviour. And it's not Western or Eastern Christians that are doing this. Mm -hmm. It's actually Jewish believers in Messiah. Get them into the land and be, they, to, to salvation. But that is the real time between Arab and Jew. Also, I said this was a family feud as well. I mean, yeah. now yeah. it's you're talking about the rejected ones, and there are two rejected ones coming up in, the, in the story of the Genesis story. Yeah. And first yeah. and foremost is Ishmael, the the son of, of Abraham and Hagar. Yes. yes. Now Ishmael grew up; uh, he was older than Isaac, but God said. You know, he, I will bless Ishmael. I will bless him. Up. Kings will come from him. Yes. And, yes. you know, he would make him into a great nation. And let's, let's be honest, the Arabs are a great nation. Yeah. yeah. And they are. And there's a lot to come from the Arab world. The descendants of Ishmael. But also there's the descendants of Esau, Edom. Yeah. And Edom was Israel's sworn enemy. They hated the Jews. They hated Judah. 
They were rejoicing when the Babylonians took, took oh, Jerusalem. Oh. It says that in, in, Obed, in the prophecy of Obadiah, when he, he invades against Edom, the hatred. And also, okay, Edom was destroyed, but it came to Yedumia in um in in the south near near in the south in the negev but the origins of the origins of the the conflict the family feud goes back to the arabs arab arab descendants of both e of esau and ishmael all right that also has the roots of islam which actually lie within edom thank you thank you for uh, sharing sharing that that is that is deep but I want to ask at this moment that, uh, talking about the way forward, what does all this conflict uh, play? What role does the conflict play in well, es the conflict. eschatology in terms of the return of Christ? Where are we? Where, well, where where we, go, we go from here. We go from here. We're looking at the, the, the times of shaking. Mm. And it said in Haggai, I will shake the heavens and the earth mm -hmm. and see what we've got. We've got pandemic. We've got COVID, mm -hmm. a pandemic of shaking. Yeah. We have economic shaking. We have wars and rumors of wars. We put potentially for famine. But look what's happened with you. The Ukraine is it, and mm -hmm. Russia is in the hands of a, yes. you know, Putin's a, a demonically inspired lunatic. Mm -hmm. with a war with a war with a war war against a war against ukraine which has actually shut off a large measure of grain supply especially to countries in africa where yeah. because the ukraine it's a bread basket and it is you drop 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 a seed in there anything will grow in that land it's so fertile yeah and we're getting the grain out from is get, Odessa's blockaded, so they can't get the grain out. We can get it out through Poland if we have to, but it's it's a longer it's a longer and more expensive process to do so. But that's going to lead to hunger and to shortages and to famine. Yeah, and people are seeing prices get inflation and price inflation, and that's leading to to a political, social, and political unrest. Yeah, and. And so you're looking at all of this. Now, if you take to Matthew 24, the, the Oli, what, what's called the Olivet Discourse. Yes. yes. This is all part of prophecy. And the return of the Jewish people, again, has been prophesied. Mm -hmm. It was prophesied in Amos, it's prophesied in Isaiah. And also, Christians should again we are enjoined psalm 22 to pray for the peace of jerusalem to pray for the jewish people mm -hmm. to pray for them to receive their messiah yeah. to pray for their welfare and well-being because those who bless you then genesis 12 those who bless you then will i bless yes yes and i think partly also that jewish people have not been replaced in God's purposes. Mm -hmm. There is a seed in Western theology, and it really is pernicious. Well, it's it's not just in Western theology; it's also in in Catholic theology and in Orthodox theology as well. Where what evangelicals and the British evangelicals in the nineteenth century, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, John C. Ryle, first Bishop of Liverpool, Anthony Ashley Cooper. They believed in very much that God's word actually means what it says. The plain sense makes sense. Seek no other sense. <laughs> that's, that's the way I look at God's word. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind <laughs> by no means. <laughs> and Paul's act of evangel in Romans 1 16, the yeah. gospel yeah. to Jew to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Yes. So yes. Jews have not been replaced in the purposes of God. To say that, it, in fact, the roots of that really go back to the to the third and the fourth century um, mm -hmm. into Christian theology. Um, that's one thing I had to do in my, in my master's degree was the was church was patristics, the church fathers, and so the, this is the pillar Oregon, which led which um, which led to August. Um, which Augustine, Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, used for his theology, 
um, which came out with Martin Luther in, in 1543. It's, that is the idea that Jews are, you know, well, they're there, but what use are they fundamentally? Yeah. And yeah. yet God has not finished with them because in Jeremiah, you know, my 31, it, as long as the sun, shine, the sun shines and sun and moon are there, and keep and they keep going night and day follows day follows night the jewish people shall remain as a, shall still be a nation before me yeah. yeah and they still are a nation before god because yeah. consider what's happened to them they've been scattered all over the world and yep you know again refugee populations get absorbed within two, gen two generations yeah. but the thank jews you. have been thank you so much pastor david yeah. So, so if if I'm, I'm I'm understanding you right and following you, all that you're saying is that all that is happening in terms of this conflict is a fulfillment of prophecy. It's just um, yeah. the word of God being unfolded right before yeah. our eyes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, I believe that. Again, that reconciliation between Jew and Arab can only come mm -hmm. in Messiah Yeshua. Yeah. That's all it can come. Now. Yeah. Again, politically, you've got what you've got. Again, you've seen the Abraham Accords negotiated by President Trump. Um, again, the Arabs are looking at the Palestinians and you have know, Mahmoud yeah. Abbas, the Hamas, the Hezbollah, and the Palestine, the PFLP, etc., etc. Yeah. And they took, they took one look and they said, they've just lost patience with them. So we're going to make our own accommodation with the, Jew with the Jewish state. Yeah. Israel is here to stay. We may not like it, we may not like the Jewish state, yeah. but you know, there, there are advantages to recognise it, we might as well get along with that. Yeah. Now, in Israel itself, there's a little village southwest of Jerusalem, in fact, it's called Abu Ghosh, and it's actually called the, the hummus capital of Israel. Mm -hmm. It's an Arab village, Muslim Arab village. It's now actually getting to the status of a city. It's, that, it's grown to that size. Mm -hmm. they, they, they said to themselves, right, what are we going to do? Oh. This is 1948. So the Jews are going to get this land anyway. So what do we do? Do we run? Do we go? Or do we stay and make the best of it? Oh. So they decided to stay, make the best of it, and live in peace with the Jewish people. Yeah, and God has prospered that that, that place. Yeah, it has prospered it because they have. Well, he's not blessed the Jewish people. He's yeah. not cursed them and fight a fight against them. Yeah. So I said, fine, I'll let you yeah. alone. You will prosper because my word means what it says. Yeah. God's counsel yeah. will not be denied. Simple as that. It's that. Yeah. It's it's a case yeah. of believing so God's problem. word. Sorry, yeah, anyway. No problem. No problem. Thank you so much. I, I think that one actually one one of the aspects of this history that that really intrigues me and marvels me is how the war in 1948 ended. You know the fact that all these nations could not stand up against that little nation of Israel. You know that speaks volumes of God's invisible hand at work in all of this. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, because there is no no way on earth. Israel should have won that war. That clearly exactly. tells us that God is the master of the universe and he is in charge. He has the final say. But I pray, <laughs> I pray that you know that the church of the 21st century will play our role and do what God has called us to do. Because ultimately, uh, the church's place in eschatology is very, very crucial. We have to do our part mm. you know, by sending forth the gospel onto the ends of the earth. Jesus said Amen. that. That is, it is after we have done that, that he will return. So I pray that as the church, we will also play our role. It's unfortunate that time has become our enemy. Our time is up. <laughs> <laughs> our time is up. And so I will give you maybe a minute to give your closing remarks. And then we share a word of prayer and bring to tonight's program to an end. So if you give us just uh, 30 seconds of a closing thought, and then we will pray and draw down the curtain on tonight's program. Amen. Yeah, that, my final thought is that it's, it's 
all the efforts that's been made by politicians. I mean, mm. I mean, a lot of Christians have joined in, joined in with them and said, you know, we have a two state solution, which it, it's simple fact. You cannot divide God's land. In mm. Joel 3, Joel said, I will bring the nations to judgment at the valley of Jehoshaphat. Uh -huh. the way that they have divided my land. Yes. That, that land is God's land and it's not subject to division. Mm. He will he will not allow that mm. and he will punish anyone who does and it, it will be a severe punishment and i also mm. would say quote from isaiah 60 any nation that will not serve you i.e the jewish people in israel mm. i will utterly lay waste mm. and that i would i would give it as an as an encouragement but also as a mm. solemn mm. warning because this is important. This is part of God's end time plan and part of the time for the return of the Messiah. So keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. But pray for their well-being and protection. God, God loves the Arabs. He died for Arabs as well as Jews. So and pray for the conversion of Arabs and and felt, and what has happened to places like Stella Carmel. Jewish believers and Arab believers working together, worshipping together, Messiah as one people. That's Thank it. You. Amen and amen. Thank you so amen. much. So to our dear listeners, before we round up, if you are listening to us, I believe that one important lesson that we're learning from tonight's program, all the history that we've been exposed to concerning the conflict, one main lesson we learn is that God is the master of the universe and his word is true because all that we've seen has been prophesied in scripture and that proves that God is real, Amen. God is real and his word is true so if you do not know Jesus we want to use this opportunity to encourage you to surrender your life to Christ the Bible says that it's appointed unto man once to die and after that death judgment you know your relationship with God and Christ here on earth will determine your relationship or where you would be uh, to spend eternity after life on earth. So we want to encourage you to surrender your life to Christ if you have none. And before we sign off tonight, if you want to give your life to Christ, please, uh, please take a minute and say this prayer with me. Say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for loving me and for dying on the cross for me. Tonight, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and I surrender my life unto you. I repent of my sins. Take my life and use it for your glory. Help me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you say that prayer with us, we want to encourage you to find a Bible-believing church where you can be nurtured in God's word and disciples so that you maximize your potential and be all that God has called you to be. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. Also, on behalf of all our listeners, I want to say a big thank you to Pastor David for joining us all the way from United Kingdom. Uh, not forgetting Bishop Joe. Bishop Joe had to leave because of an emergency. He had to leave. But I also want to say a big thank you to Bishop Joe, who also joined us on this segment. So if the Lord tarries, we're going to come your way once again next week, same time, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, and then 8.30 in Ghana, 9.30 in the UK. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. On behalf of all our listeners, I want to say thank you so much, Pastor David, and we hope to have you back on the hour of glory. May the Lord bless you. Shalom. God bless Shalom. you. Shalom. You're welcome. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So, far. so we'll have this music in the background, and then we'll be out of here. God bless you. God bless you so much. Bless you. Bless you. Show us your power every day. Can you help us sing? Show us your glory.